Bibles, would you open them once again to the great book of Genesis, the one that begins it all, and we can learn so much from it. Turn to the 11th chapter, we're going to read the last two verses of the 11th chapter, and the first five verses of the 12th chapter for our text this morning, uh, as we talk about a new father's father. As I said, this, uh, we're going to look and see two dads, uh, actually three, uh, in, the, in the scripture. Uh, and uh, one will be good, one will be bad, and one's almighty. Amen. And uh, uh, through this tonight, today, and next week, we're going to see what a difference walking with God makes. Now, let me say, that neither one of these, of course, God's perfect, he's the third one, but neither one of the two men are perfect. Both are sinners. Both make a lot of mistakes. And both fail. The difference is that one does it with God and the other one doesn't. And it makes a world of difference in people's lives. So if you'll stand with me and I ought to read God's word. Matthew chapter, I mean Genesis chapter 11, beginning at verse 31. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees, or Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, or Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all that substance that they had gathered together, and the souls that they had gotten, that be the servants and everything, plus the family, in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Father, as always, we ask you to bless the reading of your word, and for the time ahead, we pray, Father, the Holy Spirit, to bring this message through me, your servant, Father, that we might hear and understand the message of this message and the one next week, and how you lead and how important the father of dad being a, a godly dad. In Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, we've seen in this study <coughs> that the judgment of God is just as strong as the love of God. And all humankind would do very well to remember that fact. We often hear a lot about the love of God, but we fail to hear a lot about the judgment of God. The entire earth world would have been totally destroyed, and there would have been nothing else about earth. But one man, Noah, found grace or favor in God's eyes. He was spared along with his wife, three sons, and three daughters-in-laws, and a, rep a representative of the animal, the bird and the insect world. After the flood, we found last week that Noah was a, was a vineyard keeper, the Bible calls him husbandman, 
And uh, he, he grew such good grapes, he made wine out of it, and he liked his wine so much, he drank too much and got drunk, went to sleep naked in his, uh, in his tent on his bed. And uh, uh, his son, uh, Ham, uh, disgraced him, uh, both himself and his dad during that time. But the other two sons, Shem and Japheth, they respected their father, and they went in backwards and covered their dad so that no shame would come. While it remains royal, the royal lineage will not advance without sin. And this lineage that we're going to begin today is the lineage from which Christ himself, Jesus, will be born. But that lineage will remain with sin until it reaches Jesus. Jesus alone could take the lineage and live it without sins. Thus, the relationship of God with humans continues today. So we look at the man who will become known as Father Abraham by Jews, by Muslims, and by Christians. So we get an idea of how important this text is today as we see the beginning of a new ministry on this earth through a man called Abraham. First thing, we need to look at from Noah to Abram. How did we get here? How did we get from the flood, and the ark lighting, and Noah and his family coming on? Well, through his son Shem, Noah, uh, through his grandson, our fact, had a seven time great grandson. That'd be great, 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 great grandson, seven time, named Terah. Terah apparently set up his home in a place called the Ur of the Chaldees. And there he had three sons of his own, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran as a person means mountaineer. And as a place, it means parched. So Ur, which was located in northern Mesopotamia in what is now called Iraq, we see that, and we can see where that name fit in very well. That uh, he and death definitely was, uh, was, was very dry and rocky and everything. Terah, Abram's dad, earned a living by making false gods. So that's important that we get this beginning of this great man. That three, the three major God professing religious, even though Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship, but to call it a religion, those three religions, all three call this one man Father. So God has an important mission for him in life. He will make a lot of mistakes. He very well shows he's human and not the Christ. But nevertheless, he loved God, but he didn't start off in a godly home. His dad did not worship God, but rather he earned his living making false idols of false gods. So Abram grew up not only in a not godly home, but a big ungodly home, making false gods and everything. Uh, he had every opportunity to be a worshiper of idols and all kind of false gods, the moon god, the star god, the cloud god, the sun god, the dirt god, the tree god, the frog god, god they, all kind of frogs, I mean, I mean gods, frogs being one of them. <laughs> By the way, frog is a representative of the other side, not God's side. Yeah, right. But in this, in this living, growing up, we often say like father, like son. That's not always true. That's true. Like mother, like daughter. That's not always true. This young man, young boy, Abram, grew up in a situation to where he could have been one of the most ungodly human beings to ever live. But yet, in the, 
in the midst of, of growing up, he got a call from God. And that brings us to the 12th chapter. Now, I put a note here. You may wonder why that's all important. Well, it's important because of what we're going to look at next, where we go from. It's important to know that by all birthrights, human birthrights, that Abram should have been a false god worshiper. By trade, he should have been one who followed in his dad's footsteps and made false idols to represent these false gods for the people to bow down to. He himself may have even been an ordained servant of some false god or all of them. He may have carried a lot of credentials. That could have been his legacy. That he was chief among the ungodly. But in the midst of this, we have verses 1 through 3 of the 12th chapter. And I want to read that again. Keep in mind this time as I read it, that the person God is speaking to has been raised to the point of being a married man. Remember talking about Sarai, his wife? Abram is a grown man. He's married to Sarai. Her name will be changed as well to Sarah. But in the midst of this, in the midst of an ungodly, idol-worshiping family and community, God speaks to one person. Abram and Abram is able to understand him and hear him. And this is what God says. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and unto a land that I will show you. We're going to get some points out of there in a moment. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless them that curse you. I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. And today all families of the earth are blessed through this man named Abram. It's true word. And Abram is a blessing. Abram then, the son of an idol maker, in a family of worshippers of false gods, gets a special call from God on the red hotline. You've heard about the president's hotline, red phone. It's an important phone. When I was stationed in Germany, one of my responsibilities when I was working the night shift at the, at the change was that I went into this very guarded, classified room, and it had a red phone. And it had some equipment it was attached to. And at a given time, besides specific time, my responsibility was to get on that phone and call Washington, D.C. And I was to speak to the White House operator. And he would acknowledge who he was and where he was, and what he was supposed to do, and then I would acknowledge the same thing to him. And then we would give a code word that only we would know. And having done that, then we would take and we would, we would look up from a locked strong box, we would look up the code for the coming 24-hour period. And we would simultaneously put the codes in the system. Then having done that, we would tell each other, go to coding. We would push a button, and then what we said would be garbled. So it could not be interpreted or intercepted in any way. Then after we said something there, we'd go back in the clear and we'd finish that phone call. So it was important to know that that line 
It was of nailing. One night, I had a switchboard. I, my specialty was communication. Somebody says, oh, I said, you didn't learn a whole lot. <laughs> but my specialty was communication at various times. And one night, I was on the, on the night shift, and I was actually going out to relieve the, the switchboard operator for break. And Washington's phone rang up. Now, this wasn't on the hotline. This was on the regular line from the Washington, from the president. And uh, it was night time, and I answered the phone, and the operator in Washington says, I have a priority one call for General So-and-so, the commander there in Europe. And we had, we had a military phrase I can't utter here in church about, are you kidding me? So we didn't say kidding me. <laughs> and, uh, and I said that. And before the operator could answer, this voice on the other line with a deep Texas roll said, no, he isn't, Herman. Could I get to General so-and-so? It's the middle of the night, the general's sleep. I said, yes, sir. I said, take me just a moment to get him away. So I buzzed him until he missed your phone. And I said, General, I got the president on the line speaking to you, and guess what he did? He said the same thing I said to the president. <laughs> I said, no, sir, I'm telling you, are you ready to speak to the President of the United States? And he said, yes, I am, and I connected him. I have no idea what he spoke about, but I, I know it was after President Kennedy had been assassinated and President Johnson had become President of the United States, so he was making calls to different military commanders. So a phone call is a very important thing. Yeah. And I hadn't planned to say all that, but it just came to me. And this is what happens. God's got on the red line. This phone call is for one individual man in a family and a community of idol worshipers. And God is able to speak to him. Now listen, I'll tell you why what I've told you thus far is so true and so important and it mirrors today. Remember that I have told you many times that I believe in every human being that God has planted a seed to allow individuals to know beyond a shadow of a doubt there is one supreme God. Yeah. And this is a great example of that. I heard this morning two great preachers, pastors, say the same thing in their own language, and that's Dr. Jack Graham and Dr. Charles Stanley. I watched both of them this morning, and they both made the same statement in their own words, that individuals are given a seed in their system to know that God is real. So anybody who says they do not believe in God they are overriding the seed God put in them to know that he is real. Right. And they are denying God on purpose. <laughs> it's not an accident. No. We will say, they, one of the favorite sayings is the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make one, anyone deny God. The individual has to make himself deny God. Now you don't have to follow God. Even the devil won't deny God. He knows God's truth. Well, we got to go. On. Yeah. So some say that can't be true, but it is on beauty. You see, there are two other seeds in every human being as well. One seed is a seed of free choice, which drives every human being. Free choice. We have that seed. We're not we're not guided by by some mysterious force in everything we say and do and every place we go. But rather, we have a seed of free choice, and we like that, don't we? We go to a restaurant. We don't have to eat what everybody else is eating. Everybody else is eating steak. We might want frog legs. That's right. you know? We don't have to eat that. So we love having free choice. The other is the desire to be like God, or mostly to be God. Within the human being is a seed to be God-like or to be God. What does that mean, preacher? 
That means we, uh, we like to decide for ourselves what's going to happen to us. We like to decide where we'll go, what we'll do, what we'll study, what we won't study, whether we'll pick cotton or not pick cotton, whether we'll rob banks or whether we'll go to church. We like to make our own decisions, do we not? That's the seed put in us. That's the reason we do have a choice. I hear people say, well, those people brought up the land, they don't have a choice. Look at what Abraham was brought up in. I doubt if Abraham, Abraham, Abraham had heard anything about God other than the fact maybe his name. He was taught idol worship and everything. But in the midst of this, he learned that God is real. In the midst of a family and community of worshipers of faith God, one man, Abram, let his seed of knowing God has to exist be stronger than the pull of family and community and decided for himself there must be one supreme almighty God and he wanted that God. Today there's a lot of false gods. Nothing has changed. That's another thing I've said. Especially on Wednesday night. If you ask those folks, going, oh, every Wednesday night, he says it three or four times. Mm -hmm. Because we're studying the book of Isaiah on Wednesday night. And I keep telling them, nothing has changed. We keep thinking we've changed. We haven't. No, we haven't. We are exactly like Adam and Eve. We're exactly like Terah and Abram. We're exactly like Peter, Paul, and John. We're exactly like our great great grandfathers and grandmothers. We have not changed. The only thing that's changed is what we wear and what we play with. That's right. When I was a boy, we got a stick and played cowboy and Indian. Now they use the real thing. Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. But people are the same. Those three seeds were put in Adam and Eve, and there have been in every human being that's ever been born on the face of this earth. We make those decisions. Adam is told that God has a job for him. I've got a job for you, son. I'm going to bless you and you're going to bless others. Matter of fact, you're going to be such a blessing you're going to bless the whole human race, or through you, the whole human race is going to be blessed on earth. Now that's, that's a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. That makes a preacher want to get up and preach. Yeah, amen. But there's a lot of gods today. People don't like calling them gods. They, they call them other things. Some call their gods family. Wait a minute, preacher. You, you misspoke that. No, I said exactly what I put in my notes. Some people call their little G gods family. Where do you get that? I get that because they always put their family before God. I've heard people say, well, I'm not going to do this because of my family. God said, well, I can't do this to your family because of you. Right. Family can be a false god. That's right. Work can be a false god. That's right. Work, work, work. I'm too busy. I got too much work to do to do anything for God. Can't go to his house. Can't participate. Can't be a worker in the house of God because I've just got too much work to do. That's a god. Some people don't even believe in God. That's their God. They just do it, work themselves to death, as we say. Some people, the social life is their God's. Oh, I, I, I can't do it for God because uh, the social crowd that I'm with, we, they don't do that. They, they, they wouldn't let me in with them if they knew that I, I was going to go to church and still going to do this. You know, sports. That's a mighty big God. Mighty big God is sports. They slowly have taken over God's time. <laughs> That's right. Nothing wrong with sports. Nothing wrong with playing a ball game or whatever. No. Tossing the disc or whatever. 
But when the sport rises to the point it takes over God's time, then it becomes a little G God. God still has the same requirement to be His. One must forsake all others, including family, and to Him be true. Wow. You mean God's really like that? God's exactly like that. God, in His own words, the word, the, the Bible, He says, if I'm not number one, I am nothing. That's it. God will never, ever accept being number two. No. God says, if I can't be number one, I'm not yours and you're not mine. What did he say about those that's not his? You are of your father the devil. Wow. Wow. I don't know what my kids have told, <laughs> told me if I'd have told them that. <laughs> I'm not number one to you. I'm nothing to you. They probably say, well, bye, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> God says, I've got to be number one. Anything or anyone that we put before God Almighty is a little G God in our life. We don't like to call them that. Oh, no, we like to call them hobbies. We like to call them pastime. We like to call them responsibility. Abram listened to God over everyone and everything. Every person in his family, every person in his community would be telling him, Abram, don't be foolish. Don't you believe that unknown God? You better follow the ways of terror, your father. And that brings us to point three. God's call to Abram. And these are still the instructions for today. That's the reason I wanted to get this message in. This first part. Too much to try to get in one. I probably won't finish this first part. I'll start off with it next Sunday. But what God says to Abram, the instructions are still the instructions today. First instruction. Leave your past. Leave your past. God said, get up and get away. Get up and get away. What's it? Get away from your past. You cannot have me and your past at the same time. He said, get out of your past. Leave it behind you. If you want me to be your God, if you want me to bless you, if you want me to provide your needs, if you want me to heal your sick, Raise your dead to all these things. You've got to forget your past and let me be your one and only now. No other way works with God. Now get this. This is important. That does not always mean get physically away. Y'all are raised in there like get up, leave your family. No. It doesn't necessarily mean get physically away. God doesn't say for us to forsake our families. He doesn't say we have to physically leave our families. What God is saying is anything in your family or in your present or in your past that's against me, you've got to get rid of it. That's still the way today. Little Isaiah, smart as a whip. Along by himself in his bedroom, said his nightly prayers, the Holy Spirit came all over him as he said. He didn't know he said, You came all over me. <laughs> and at that moment, for Isaiah to be what we call saved, the Bible calls it born again. In order to be born again, Isaiah had to make the decision to put God first. Put God first. He's got to be number one or he's no number at all. all right. You know what the Bible says? Let me give you four things that Jesus says from each of the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 57, he says, And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. 
A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house or his own family. In Mark chapter 6 verse 4, Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. Then in Luke chapter 4 verse 24, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. And then John puts it this way in chapter 4, verse 44. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Do you know that as a rule, a pastor, a preacher's greatest ministry, greatest results, if you measure that in the number of souls won, the, 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 the ministry of the people to the, to the community and all that, the, the greatest accomplishment in his ministry will be away from his, own, his home area. That's the reason so many preachers leave their hometown area, their home county. They are more successful when they go to a strange place that doesn't know them. Well, why is that, preacher? Isn't God the same wherever you go? Yes, He is, but the people are not. You see, the reason that that is true, and it's not a hundred percent, but in most cases, you talk to every pastor who's pastoring in his home county and city versus pastor somebody else. He'll say, "Oh, it was much easier elsewhere. It was more successful elsewhere." And the reason for that is the hometown folk know you're growing up. They know what you did back then. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter that God's forgiven you and forgotten it. They haven't. Right. And it's hard for the hometown folk to come to church and see a preacher up there that they know broke in the Boy Scout hut down at the Calhoun High School football field and stole a hot Coca-Cola. I won't name that preacher, but I know one that did. <laughs> With a friend of his. And I say no again, it's not all we had to do was open the door. We didn't break anything. It was, my it was a hot day. We were thirsty. And my friend said, I know where there's some coats. You do, know, yeah. Then I said, well, we can't get it. Oh, yeah, can. They don't lock the door. We opened that door. We went in there. We each got us a hot we used to call them dope. Remember that? We used to call them dope. Yeah. We got us a hot dope, Coca Cola. We opened that up. We drunk that hot coke. We got outside. It was even hotter than before. <laughs> well, my friend who was with me, he could never forget that I went in and stole Coca Cola with him. Those words we say, those acts we do in school and on the job. People are slow to forgive these things they, they see us do. So we've got to get away. Second instruction, follow God's leadership. Not only have you got to get away from your past, you've got to follow God's leadership. The Lord said, go to where I show you. Do not let your mind lead you. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. We often say, let your conscience guide you. Even that's not good. Some, of, some people have a seared conscience. It don't work right. There's a lot of people do bad things and they don't have, they, their conscience is not bothered about it. If it were, they wouldn't do it. So you can't go by your conscience. You have to let what you know guide you. Listen to what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 16, 26. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. And then in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 26, chapter 12. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also shall my servant be. 
If any man serve him, him will my father serve me, him will my father honor. People most often give this world's instruction instead of God's instruction. We love to give instruction to people we care about, don't we? Oh, yeah. We like to tell them where to go, where to work, who to marry, how many kids to have, what to name them, what foods to like. We like to give instructions to people. But our instructions are not always the right one. That's and then God doesn't just leave it there. God says, I've got some benefits for you. And listen to these benefits. <coughs> he says, if you'll do what I tell you, if you'll forget your past, if you'll truly follow me, here are the benefits. He says, I will make greatness from you. God is a great God doing great things. He said, if you'll forget your past, follow me now, I will make great things from you. Number two, he says, I will bless you. Not only with material blessings, but principally with uh, spiritual blessings. If you'll forget your past, follow me, I will bless you. Third, he says, I will make your name great. As Abram's is among the Jews, his descendants, his name is famous in their history. I got much longer. So that name, God kept his promise. That name is great. And especially as his name is great among those who obtain the same like faith that he had to trust God. We all call his name. We all teach about him with great love and fondness and appreciation. Fourth, not only does God say, I will bless you. Fourth thing, he says, I'll give you. You will be a blessing. Isn't that wonderful? Do you know it's impossible for a believer living a believer life not to bless people? I didn't say it was impossible for a believer not to bless people. It's impossible for a believer living the believer's life according to the word. It's impossible for them not to bless people. Why? Because they're covered, they're filled with the blessing of God, and wherever they go, blessings go with them. Amen. Whatever community they in, whatever situation, wherever they go, if they're living the godly life and they're believers in Christ Jesus, wherever they go, people will be blessed because they are present. That's right. That's true. Wow. In the roughest places on earth. People have been blessed because a godly human being was in their presence. Yes. Do you know overseas, in what we call the underdeveloped countries, some of them, over there, you know, by the way, you know where all the faith, faith healers are today? Remember over here, people just have these after tents? They used to go, they come be healed on. You know where they are now? They're over there. Yep. Nobody here believes anymore. So they go over there where, the, where they're so dumb they just simply believe the word of God. And I said that whatever, proficiency or whatever that word is. Kidding me. They haven't grown up in church. They haven't heard all the many preachers. They haven't seen the believers not living their lives. So when this preacher gets up there and preaches to them and, and he says, I am the God that healeth you. If you got infirmities, come. And people come down the aisle to that preacher and they got limbs missing. They got all kinds of diseases. Their bodies are warped and everything. And, and the believers there, they lay hands on them and pray for them. And those people walk out of there healed. Not the preacher. No. It's the faith of those people coming to accept the word from the one they have faith in. Amen. That preacher bring that word. Amen. And they come down and they believe. They believe simply because they've seen the blessings of God on this individual. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I'm telling you today, you bless Israel and God will bless you. Yes. Now, I'll ask the preacher, I see them on TV. 
and, and the conference, and they'll go, all oh, that's just hot, so, oh, gosh, that's nonsense, that's not true, that don't hold true anymore. When Christ came, then we don't have to bless Israel because we got Christ. I can tell you what the Word of God says is, you better bless Israel. Right. Because those who bless Israel, I will bless. This church was hurting. I don't want to speak much about the ministry uh, uh, here, but this church's ministry. This church was hurting nine years ago. The ones here were strong in spirit. But it was a few people had to do everything. And they were hurting. And I didn't come with anything much. Except I did tell them one thing. The Bible says if we bless Israel, they'll bless us. Mm -hmm. And they said, what should we do, preacher? I said, we need to send a monetary donation every month to Israel. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, I, I'll find out. And I found a food ministry over there that feeds the hungry Jews in Israel. And I said, this right here, they're reliable. I've checked them out. They've got a good reputation. They do what they say. I've seen the, the evidence from the others who sent me. I said, this is where we need to send our money every month. And we have sent that amount every month since then, except when we actually increased the amount. We started sending a bit more. Then I lot sent, and we sent something. And those that were here will tell you about that time God started blessing this church. About that time, this guy came walking in on a Wednesday night for crutches. <coughs> he brought his dad with him. And I believe his cousin. And they sat there on a Wednesday night. And then after that, this young man on his crutches, he says, this used to be my church home. And we moved, and I went to others, and I'd like to come back here. I said, well, you're more than welcome. And he said, well, this is where I'm going to start coming to church. He came to church, came down, moved his membership here. In, a, in, a, in not too long a period of time, he came to me and he said, my cousin wants you to know something. And I said, what's that? She wants to know if it'd be all right if she brought a, a van load of kids to church. <laughs> I said, Perry, I believe that would be <laughs> I said, young man with a crutch. <laughs> I think that would be more than all right. I would be think that would be a wonderful thing to do. So the cousin started borrowing her sister van and brought a 15 passenger van loaded with 16 kids. <laughs> and uh, that young man with crutch brought it. And this church had been praying for kids. And it wasn't too long before others started coming in. And we got to the point where this church is packed with kids. Yeah. And God blessed us. What was that? That was God under his word. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because of my preaching. It wasn't because of my teaching. It wasn't because of my shouting or my whispering. It was because this church has a spirit and desire to follow God and to believe God's word and to act upon God's word. See, it takes all three. You don't got to follow it, you got to believe it, and then you have to act upon it. And those things will be my final point. Finally, this morning, Abram's response, verse 4. Abram departed and went as the Lord told him. This is seven things Abram did. Abram did not try to make deals with God. 
Well, wait a minute now, God. They say, oh, that's a big thing you're asking me. Leave my country, leave my family, leave all these people behind. Wait a minute now. Let's see. Here, here, here's my deal with you. No, he didn't do that. He did not try to make a deal. Don't ever try to make a deal with God. God's not in the deal making business. God is in the commandment business. And the fulfillment of his commandments. Don't ever try to make a deal with God. Lord, I'll go if you'll bless me with money. God, I'll go if you'll bless me with children. God, I'll go if you'll give me a new car. God said, if you go and I'll decide how many cars you get, how many children you get. Abram did not try to twist what God said to his own will. Oh, yeah. Well, folks, now God told me that he's got a plan for my life. And boy, he, he's going to make me rich. I'm, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be on TV. I'm, I'm going to have a television ministry. Third, Abram did not seek some wise man's opinion. Uh, thank God for that. Amen. All the wise men in his community would say, No, Abram, go lock yourself in that John and stay there until God's gone. <laughs> Number four, Abram did not make excuses like Moses did. Remember what Moses said? Well, I can't hardly talk the language. I've been out this desert for 40 years. I can't even talk the language anymore, God. <laughs> I said, don't you worry about that. I, I've got a spirit to speak to you. <laughs> Abram did not sit down and rewrite God's instruction. Wow. Wow. It makes me sick now to hear some ministries, some preachers, and some churches rewriting God's instructions to fit their own little deal. Mm -hmm. Making the Bible say what they wanted to say rather than studying it out. Well, preacher, don't you do that sometimes? Yeah, but I studied it out. I know what God has really said the first time. You know the whole Bible that way? No, I don't. If I did, I would have a TV ministry, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Number six. Abram did not say, now listen to this, Abram did not say, well, let me pray about it, God. <laughs> hey, whoa, I, we heard that, haven't we? Yeah. Hey, we, we need a Sunday school check. Well, let me pray about it. <laughs> well, we need one next week. Well, let me pray about it. Next week, you pray. Well, I'm still praying. God ain't giving you an answer yet. You know when God gives them the answer? When somebody else takes the job. Oh, yeah, God didn't want me to have the answer. The time to act is when God says move. Yes. Right then. Yes. And just like people quench the spirit and sit on the benches when God's called to be saved, they do the same thing when God calls them to serve. Mm -hmm. 